Hi, I'm Tom, and I'm at the beginning of my journey to upgrade my gas boiler with an air-sourced heat pump. When I read about the downsides of upgrading from a traditional gas boiler to an air-sourced heat pump, one of the things I constantly come across is the need to upgrade all the radiators and upgrade all the pipework in your house, uh, causing massive disruption and adding mountains of cost to what's already an expensive proposition. In this video I'm going to try and assess my current pipework so that I have a much better understanding of what sort of disruption I can expect when I actually start the process of upgrading. Now I'm learning as I go uh, so I'm bound to make some mistakes uh, along the way so please be patient and uh, take what I say with a little pinch of salt. This video will be the first of many I hope to make over the coming months documenting my journey from, from gas to electrical heating. So if you'd like to follow along, uh, please do subscribe. When moving from a gas boiler to an air sourced heat pump or a heat pump of any kind, there's a couple of things that need to be considered. But before I dive into, into those considerations, I'd like to add a little bit of context to this in the way of heat loss. In some of my previous videos, I will have displayed a slide like this. And I say things like, my heat loss at minus three is only seven kilowatts. Knowing your heat loss is very important, whether you're using a gas boiler or a heat pump, as it tells you how much heat you need going into your house to keep it nice and cozy. And the amount of heat you need remains the same, whether you're heating with gas, electricity, or a radioisotope thermoelectric generator like astronaut Mark Watney. What changes when you move from gas to a heat pump is how you generate the heat. Gas boilers generate heat by burning gas. Heat pumps generate heat by extracting it from the air or the ground using a compression cycle just like a fridge. Now I'm looking at getting what's called an air to water heat pump, and that works by taking heat from the air, transferring it into water, and then moving that water around the radiators. Now all this works because water can carry heat. In fact, it can carry a lot of heat. It's really excellent at carrying heat. The amount of heat a liquid can hold is known as the specific heat capacity and water has a really, really high value for that. Now, I won't go into the numbers, but it's enough to know that one liter of water holds a certain amount of heat based on its temperature. The hotter the water, the more heat it's carrying. But contrary to common sense, the actual temperature of the water is only half the story when it comes to keeping you warm in your home. What's as important as the amount of heat we put into the water is the amount of heat we take out of the water as it's flowing around your heating system. Gas boilers typically heat water to about 70 degrees and as the water comes back into the boiler after having flowed through all your radiators, it's typically around 50 degrees. We call these the flow and return temperatures. 70 degrees being the flow temperature and 50 degrees being the return temperature. As the water has come out of the boiler at 70 and comes back into the boiler at 50, the water has lost 20 degrees in temperature and that heat has actually been taken out of the water and put into your house. We call this drop the delta T, the DT or the difference in temperature. In the case of this example, the water has left the boiler at 70 degrees, it's returned to the boiler at 50 degrees, so our DT is 20 degrees. Heat pumps like a much smaller DT they operate really efficiently when their DT is around five degrees. So in the example here, our heat pump may be supplying water at 45. The water will come back to the heat pump at about 40, and that will give us a five degree difference in temperature, or a five degree DT. The flow temperature is also very, very important to heat pumps due to the nature of the compression cycle. The lower the flow temperature, the more efficient the heat pump will be. So for a heat pump, ideally we want a very low flow temperature and a DT of five degrees. So there's obviously practical limits to this. For example, the flow temperature can't be lower than the target temperature. You can't heat a room to 21 degrees if your radiator is only at 18 degrees. 
Now, with these different characteristics in mind, let's talk about the impact that this can have on your existing heating system. Firstly, let's talk about the radiators. So the heat coming off a radiator is impacted by a number of factors. So there is the, the temperature of the water in the radiator, the size of the radiator, and then the difference in temperature between the radiator and the room. A radiator filled with water at 70 degrees will put off more heat than the same radiator filled with water at 40 degrees. To work around this, you can replace some radiators by putting in bigger radiators, and that gives you a larger surface area, so you'll be able to tr transfer more heat out of the radiator. If that's not an option, you can always maybe add an additional radiator to a room to make up the difference. I won't go into details about radiator sizing in this video. I'll, I'll record a separate video on that in the future as it's dependent upon knowing what your heat loss is. So next we will look at what feeds our radiators and that's our pipework. Existing pipework can also have an impact on your transition from a gas boiler to a heat pump but for slightly more complicated reasons. So we remember that our heat demand which is the amount of heat we need to keep our house nice and cozy, remains the same regardless as we move from a gas boiler to a heat pump. But as it operates at a much smaller DT of five compared to our boiler's DT of 20, we're actually taking out less heat from every liter of water that's whizzing around our radiators. So to work around this, what we need to do is move more water in the same amount of time. If we're moving more water, we're moving more heat. The amount of water we're moving is measured in liters per second, and we call that the flow rate. So instead of, say, moving 300 liters of water an hour around our radiators with our gas boiler, we will now need to move, say, 1200 liters of water per hour with our heat pump. That results in the same amount of heat being delivered into the house every second, keeping our house nice and cozy. So we just crank the flow rate up, job done, right? Unfortunately, as with everything in plumbing, as I'm learning, it's a lot more complicated than it seems on the face of it. So there's two aspects to consider whenever we're moving a quantity of water. The first is how much water we're moving, so that's the volume of water. And the second is the speed at which we're moving that water. Both of these factors need careful consideration as they're impacted by this change in DT. So let's start with speed and some of the problems associated. So first, if we move water through a pipe too fast, it can cause a lot of banging and clanging due to something called cavitation. Nobody likes noisy pipework, nor do they want their submarine discovered by the enemy. If you don't get that reference, uh, please watch The Hunt for the Red October. Faster moving water also increases wear and tear on the pipework itself, and that can actually lead to problems and decrease the lifespan of your pipework. So how fast can we move water before we start to run into some of these problems? Ideally, you want water moving between half a meter a second and one and a half meter a second. And the optimum value, as I've read in countless places, is 0 0.9 meters per second. Now you'll notice I said 0 0.9 meters per second and not 0 0.9 liters per second. And that will take me on to the second consideration, which is the volume of water. A meter length of pipe can hold a certain amount of water. A 22 mil pipe will hold more water than a 15 millimeter pipe in the same meter. So if our water is moving at 0 0.9 meters per second, a 22 mil pipe will move a larger quantity of water at the same speed than a 15 mil pipe will. Thankfully, people have done all the, the maths for this and they've worked out how much heat each pipe size can carry whilst maintaining the 0 0.9 meters per second. To give you an example of that, I'm gonna switch over to HeatGeek's website, where they've got a really good article on what I'm talking about, which is figuring out if your existing pipework is suitable. 
So in this table, they've essentially listed on the left hand side a number of different pipe sizes. And along the top, they've got the speed. We can see here 0 0.9 meters per second. And they have four different DT values. Now, if we take, just look along the first row, we can see that the speed is the same uh, across all the columns, but what's changing is the DT. So you can see that as the DT widens, the amount of heat, this is measured in kilowatts, the amount of heat that we can carry in a pipe of a particular diameter increases. So the larger the DT, the more kilowatts that pipe can deliver. We can see here that a 15 mil pipe can deliver 2.75 kilowatts, but at DT15, it's able to deliver nearly 8.25 kilowatts. Now this is important. When we talked about the gas boiler DT earlier, that DT was 20. So you can see that 15 mil pipe could probably have delivered about 10 or 11 kilowatts of heat at the optimum 0 0.9 meters per second. So traditional plumbing, you could have plumbed an entire house using 15 mil pipe and moving the water with a DT of 20, you wouldn't have had any problems uh, with the speed and the heat delivery. As you can see, when we're moving to a heat pump, things become far more interesting as the capacity of these pipes is much reduced. As you can see from these figures, we're probably talking about the, the heat carrying capacity being about a quarter. And that makes sense. So if you think about the DT, DT20 versus DT5, we're talking about a quarter of the heat. So if you look at these figures, you'll see that these are roughly, if we did another figure out here, it would probably be about 10 or 11, and 2.75 is gonna be about a quarter of that. Same here, we're moving up in increments so for a 22 mil pipe, that could probably carry about 24 kilowatts at DT20, and it's only able to carry six at DT5. Now I've said plumbing is very complicated, and there's another layer of this uh, to be added into the mix, and that's pressure loss. Now for this video, I'm not going to look at pressure loss because I need more information about the heat loss which will give me the radiator sizes. And once I've got the radiator sizes, I can work out the exact flow rates that I need for that radiator. And once I have the exact flow rates, then I can work out what the pressure drop would be between the heat pump and that particular radiator. Now I will do another video on this in the future once I've completed the heat loss. So that kind of covers the basics, I hope. I hope that's clear, at least clear to me anyway. Uh, so now I want to move on to applying some of this to my own heating system. My heating system was installed from scratch uh, back at the beginning of 2021. So I've got a very good idea of the layout and composition. I took plenty of pictures and I'm probably 95% sure that I know where every pipe is and the diameter of every pipe. So armed with that knowledge, I have created a simple map of all the pipes and all the radiators. And I've used a different thickness of line where I know there's a 22 mil pipe versus a 15 mil pipe. As I've opted to ignore the radiators for this video, I'm going to take them out of the diagram. I'm also going to rearrange the diagram slightly just to give us better focus on the various branches so we can identify the different sections of pipe. And when I do that, it looks like this. So along the right hand side, I have all the radiators, all 10 of them. And I've also put a little section for the underflow heating down here at the bottom. I'm gonna use the optimum 0 0.9 meters per second. And I'm gonna use the Heat Geek lookup to check the capacity of each of these pipes in the system. Now at the start of the video, I said my heat loss was seven kilowatts. And if you were paying close attention to the heat geek table, you'll have immediately spotted the problem. So if we look here, we can see that at 0 0.9 meters per second with a DT of five, 22 millimeter pipe can only carry six kilowatts, which is a whole kilowatt less than my uh, heat loss. 
So that means that this section of pipe here, which is coming out of the boiler, can't carry the necessary amount of heat. So we're off to a bad start, but that's not the end of the story. If we now move to the right of the table, and we can work towards the left, and we'll essentially sum, at each of these branches, we'll sum up what the heat capacity or the heat requirement for each section of pipe is. With the seven kilowatt heat loss, I'm gonna do something very crude here. And I'm going to say that each radiator needs 700 watts of, of heat. That's a gross simplification and it doesn't take into account, uh, you know, the size of the room the radiator's in, the amount of glass, air changes, all of those uh, other elements that factor into heat loss. But I want to just try and keep this as simple as I can. I don't think things are going to be too far off at 700 some of the rads are going to be bigger, some of the rads are going to be smaller, but I think on the whole, hopefully it'll kind of balance itself out. But we'll, we'll work through that as we go. So if we start at the very top here, we've got our master bedroom radiator. So that means at 700 watts, this little piece of 15 mil pipe has to carry 700 watts. So if we jump to the table, we can see the 15 mil pipe can comfortably carry 2.75 kilowatts. Now we land the back bedroom in because that branches off that 15 mil pipe but we're very comfortable here so we need you know 1400 watts but we can hold 2.75 so in theory each of these rads could be 1.3 1.4 kilowatts each which is very large and this piece of pipe would have no problems carrying that heat. As we work along we'll add in the front bedroom so that will add another 700 so around here, this section of 22 mil pipe needs to carry 2.1 kilowatts. That's no problem. Add the office in, we're up to 2.8 kilowatts. That's no problem. Then we've got another little branch here coming from the bathroom and the landing. So this adds another 1400 into the equation. And that will give us a total of 4.2 kilowatts. This section of 22 mil pipe, this branch needs to carry 4.2 kilowatts. We already know that it's able to carry six, so no problems there. If we now jump down to, to this branch here, which feeds most of the downstairs, we've got the four radiators here. So again, we're gonna assume this is about 2.8 kilowatts. We can throw that figure in there. And you can see now, if we add these two together, we're up to seven kilowatts. So this section of pipe here will need to carry seven kilowatts, which we've established it can't do. And if we chuck the underfloor heating in, that'll just add another 700. So we're looking at 7.7 .7 kilowatts. The point here is that this section of pipe just isn't big enough as it stands. You can, as we've seen, work with a higher DT. So if we were to bring the DT up to seven, that pipe would have the capacity that we would need. Another option would be to move the water a little bit faster. So if we increased the speed of the water up to one or 1.1 meters per second, that would increase the capacity of that section of pipe. So despite that one section being inadequate in under optimum circumstances, the vast majority of the pipework in my house is perfectly adequate to carry that quantity of heat, which is great news. The even better news is that that section of the pipe is mounted on the wall in the garage. So the few meters of 22 mil pipe that I have in there can easily be upgraded to 28 mil pipe and I have no need to lift floorboards or redecorate anything afterwards. However, the heat carrying capacity is only half the story. I still have to think about the pressure loss. To work out the pressure loss, I need to work out my radiator sizes. So I need to do a heat loss calculation in order to, to get those values. There are a few online tools for calculating heat loss and I do plan on giving each one of those a go over the coming months. And I'll do videos on all of that once I've, uh, once I've gone through the process. Once I've got my heat loss and my radiator sizes, um, I'll then be able to do all the pressure loss and that will tell me, and that will tell me definitively how much of my pipe work is suitable. You can expect a few more videos on this subject uh, as I work through it over the coming months. So if you'd like to follow along, please do subscribe.
Well, that's it for this video. If you've enjoyed it, please do like and subscribe. If you've any questions or you've spotted some mistakes that I've made, please use the comments and let me know. And otherwise, that's it. I'm Tom and thanks for watching.